outcomes for patients with NMDA receptor encephalitis have not changed over the last decade. We need your help to refer newly diagnosed NMDA receptor encephalitis patients who may be eligible to participate in the NIH-sponsored Extinguish trial. The Extinguish trial is now enrolling new NMDA receptor encephalitis patients. To learn more, search Extinguish trial at clinicaltrials.gov or call the Extinguish hotline at 844-4-BRAIN-5. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Welcome to the Neurology Podcast. My name is John Stone. I'm a neurologist in Edinburgh and I've been doing research and clinical work in FND for the last 25 years. And I'm really excited that we are bringing a whole series for you on FND. It's our FND Roundtable. I've got three international colleagues with me, all very experienced in the field. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. My name is Sarah Lidstone. I'm a movement disorders neurologist practicing in Toronto and also the director of a rehabilitation program called the Integrated Movement Disorders Program that treats FND patients. Hi, everyone. I'm David Perez. I'm an associate professor of neurology and psychiatry at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Hello, everyone. I'm Selma Eibeck. I'm a full professor of neurology in Fribourg University, Switzerland, and I'm leading a clinical program and a research program centered on FND. So in this first podcast of three, we're going to be talking about an approach to the assessment and diagnosis of FND and something that we've learned about new phenotypes along the way. If we can start off, Selma, with you, what do we actually mean when we use the term FND? When we use the term FND, we refer to a medical condition where patient presents with neurological symptoms that can be very varied, like weakness and abnormal movement, such as tremor, visual-like episodes. And these symptoms are linked to a dysfunction of the brain. So in that sense, it is a central nervous system disorder. And what I like to explain to my patients is that the problem is not in their nerves or muscles or spinal cord, but it really lies in the brain. And the brain is unable to either in integrate all the information from a particular body part or to control that body part. Now, another very important thing when we refer to FND is to stress out that it is a positive diagnosis and that we have clinical bed signs to make the diagnosis. And I'm saying that it is important because me and a lot of neurologists of the older generation have been taught that it was a diagnosis of exclusion. But since at least 10 years now, we really see it as a positive diagnosis. And it's important that neurologists and younger generations of neurologists know how to make this diagnosis. David, take us through a bit the history here, and because there have been rapid changes, haven't there, over the last decade or two. And if you haven't been paying close attention, you might be surprised with where we've got to. I agree, John. It's been a remarkable few decades in the field. I think maybe to contextualize it, what's really happened in the field of FND is that this is no longer a diagnosis of exclusion, not something that we frame as medically unexplained symptoms, but rather using our neurologic and neuropsychiatric skill set, we can make a positive diagnosis, just as Selma pointed out, using rule-in signs on examination. And what we mean by that is leveraging our neurologic examination skill sets, including observation, appreciating Uh, potential simulogical features and motor patterns that might be specific for functional seizures or functional movement disorders, for example. And we also bring in available adjunctive testing, most commonly used in the workup for functional seizures, where some patients undergo a video EEG, for example. Let me give a few specific details on some of these rule-in signs. For example, in the realm of functional seizures, We can look for asynchronous movements, herky-jerky, stopping and starting, the kind of patterns that we might not see and we don't see in an epileptic seizure with major motor features. We might find that some of the seizures occur with tight eye closure at seizure onset. For other patients, for example, they may have a functional tremor. And on examination, we can direct them to perform paced volitional movements in another body part such as finger tapping, 
and we can actually influence the rhythm of their functional tremor, having it increase in frequency and slow down in frequency based on those pace volitional movements. We call this tremor entrainment. These are the kinds of rule-in signs we should look for, and these are the kinds of signs we should clearly document in our examination or report. So it's quite a change, isn't it? Because people still think about doing an EEG and saying, well, there's no epilepsy, so you've got non-epileptic attacks. But I mean, what you're saying here is that functional seizures have their own specific clinical features. Yes, we want to see if the patient's got epilepsy as well, but that's a secondary question. I completely agree. The other piece there, too, is understanding that the video EEG allows us to really careful viewing of the seizure onset, its full duration, and its termination. And some of that adds value as well. Certainly other ways to get that data in various clinical settings. Yeah, like smartphones, for example, particularly helpful in my practice. Absolutely. So I wonder if we can bring you in now. We're going to have a whole podcast about treatment. I wonder if you can just talk us through a bit how this different approach to diagnosis of inclusion influences your practice and the way that you communicate and subsequently treat your patients. All of us who see patients with FND on a daily basis and treat them recognize that it's not enough for the neurologist to simply have this actually quite impressive arsenal or (laughs) repertoire of these different positive sign examination maneuvers that they can do and then keep all that information to themselves. What's really crucial is sharing those with the patient and their family to really illustrate what FND actually is. And so demonstrating to the patient their own positive signs is, in my practice, at least in my experience, the most powerful way to really have the patient see and understand what this is, right? All of a sudden, their voluntary movement is disrupted. Their leg becomes weak. They're not able to move it. But then if we are able to hip flex on the contralateral side, so I'm in in essence demonstrating a Hoover sign, for example, the strength can return to normal in extension of that leg. And when the patient sees that and looks down, they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that was possible. And the family can often have the same reaction. And so there all of a sudden something clicks where the patient understands that you have seen the deficit that they are dealing with every day that's really affecting their quality of life and their functional capacity. And then they also understand, wait a minute, now there's the potential for reversibility here and there could be some recovery that can happen. And so showing patients positive signs is one of the things I do in my clinic on an absolutely daily basis. And I find it really is the most powerful communication tool in explaining what FND is, but then also setting the stage for further therapy. Well, I'm just repeatedly struck by what a light bulb moment you can give patients with these things. And it it's central, isn't it, to this diagnosis of inclusion. The other thing that allows you to do, of course, is look for FND in people who have other neurological conditions like MS or Parkinson's. Sometimes those patients do have comorbid FND, which you couldn't possibly diagnose without without a diagnosis of inclusion. I would add too, it's not just the examination. There's a number of positive signs on the history. So features that rule in that FND is a possible role uh, in, in the presentation. So an abrupt onset, for example, waxing and waning over time, although that's not specific to FND, it might increase your pretest probability. So there's many different hints that unless you ask for them, you're not going to actually find them. And it's the same thing with the physical examination. Unless you actually do these maneuvers and think about FND as you're approaching the consultation, it actually could be missed. Yeah, I think showing people their signs has to come at the end of an assessment, doesn't it, in which you've won that patient's trust. You maybe ask them what they think is wrong and what they were hoping for from the assessment and the experiences they've had with other doctors. And we'll come on to other symptoms as well a bit later and and psychiatric comorbidity because we don't want to ignore that. We don't want to suggest it's an entirely neurological domain. In terms of the assessment, it's a disorder at the interface between neurology, psychiatry, many other specialties. So we've talked a little bit about functional seizures. We've talked about functional weakness. We've mentioned functional movement disorders. But we know now there are other types of what's being increasingly recognized as as functional disorders as well that have emerged in the last five to 10 years. And John, did you want to tell us a little bit about, about some of those? Yeah, I think this is an interesting area, a sort of gray zone in a way of, uh, you know, are these disorders FND or not? I think they're definitely functional disorders, but I'm I'm thinking particularly here about when dizziness is a functional disorder and when cognition is a functional disorder. And if you haven't read or heard much about triple PD, persistent 
postural perceptual dizziness. I think that is a really valuable category. If I saw a patient today who had that, spent several years getting a diagnosis, it doesn't have positive signs in the same way as a Hoover sign, but it has diagnostic criteria that are in ICD. It describes someone with relentless dizziness, typically when they're standing, they're in a busy place, turning their head. And typically the patient comes to the clinic saying that this dizziness is just driving them mad and it won't leave them. It's often triggered by a vestibular dizzy experience, but it could be another dizzy experience. The patient today I had actually had a panic attack with dissociation. It's actually remarkably satisfying to diagnose and treat with some of the physiotherapy and psychological therapy techniques we'll be talking about in episode three. So I wanted to highlight that. And also just to challenge the audience a bit to think about cognition as a functional disorder, because again, increasingly researchers in the field are recognizing that there probably are features of a cognitive presentation, which are a bit like cognitive hoover signs. So for example, someone comes to clinic on their own, is able to tell you about lots of times that they forgot something, can answer questions with two stems. Someone who may perform very badly in neuropsychological testing in a way that might be inconsistent with their performance in real life. For example, they might be working as a business person, but scoring very badly. So have a look around for research on that, because I think it's an evolving field. We still need to develop a bit more confidence about exactly how we diagnose that. But I think there's a consensus that it definitely exists. And a bit like people in epilepsy clinics being told that they don't have epilepsy, I think we've been in the habit of perhaps people in memory clinics being told they don't have dementia, but not really being told what they do have. And this is one diagnostic possibility. We've talked a bit about the main principles of positive diagnosis, but there's a lot more to FND than just the one neurological symptom and the sign. How, in the time that we've got, do we assess and help people who also typically have many other symptoms like pain, fatigue, and other psychiatric comorbidity? How do we square that circle? John, if I may, I'd like to come back to just one additional comment around diagnosis, which is really just a cautionary note. We want to, as neurologists, make sure that we are appreciating robustly present rule in signs, not marginally present signs where you're wondering to yourself, was there potentially a positive Hoover sign or was there potentially an element of tremor entrainment? I think in some of those instances, it's really important to keep an open mind and hit the pause button. And then we've also had colleagues such as Selma really highlight the, the importance of multiple positive signs in a given patient, again, to also increase our diagnostic accuracy. And I think that for the field, as we really put an excellent spotlight on F and D, and as we then transition to some of the co-occurring symptoms, I think it's also really important to highlight that we diagnose this with high specificity and keep an open mind when there are some question marks. We can add to that that when we refer to FND, we're talking really about the presenting symptom that is neurological. But as you mentioned, John, very often these patients, actually their burden is centered on comorbid pain. Very often they also have chronic pain. And it's very important in the first consultation to also address that because they might not be bothered by the tremor. The tremor was the reason they were sent to the neurologist in the first place, but sometimes it's really the pain. And then it will influence greatly the treatment treatment. And it's also useful, I think, in the consultation to ask for other problems they can have. They can describe cognitive fog. You mentioned that sometimes it's the main symptom in cognitive function disorder, but sometimes accompanying a weakness, they also have this uh, difficulty focusing, concentrating and fatigue and sleep disorders. So this belong to the spectrum of FND. And what should we do? Do you think some if we if we're faced with a patient whose main problem is pain, for example, and fatigue, and they have a little bit of a functional tremor, do you think we should diagnose FND in that situation? I think it's still useful to diagnose FND so that the, the symptom itself is really getting the proper label, because we could then risk that they still will continue finding or, or searching for an answer of why do they have the tremor or why do they have this weakness. So I think we can do both diagnosis and say it's FND and then address in the treatment plan this comorbidity. Yeah, I think FND is reasonable, isn't it? But I must say, sometimes I would say to somebody, you've got a chronic pain syndrome, 
And you've also got a functional tremor. But let's not overburden you with diagnostic labels is one approach. I think the other piece there, John, is that if the ruling sign doesn't speak to their chief complaint, for example, fatigue or pain, I think that each of those symptoms needs a workup in and of itself. So that way, when we're speaking about our diagnostic impressions, the rule in signs motorically may help make the diagnosis of a functional motor disorder. And certainly, a subset of patients have concurrent pain and fatigue that is part of the same condition. But I am oftentimes cautious to make that conclusion up front. I think it's important to be thoughtful in the workup as well. And what you've said there really applies to comorbid psychiatric comorbidity as well, doesn't it, David? I mean, if someone's got you know, crippling anxiety, we mustn't be shy to point that out and try and formulate that with the other problems that they have. I completely agree, including the importance of a team-based approach. I know that Sarah Lidstone works in an interdisciplinary program. How do you all approach the psychiatric comorbidity piece here? I think that's also evolved. <laughs> and as medicine becomes less and less siloed and more and more integrated, which obviously happens varying degrees in different places in the world and different institutions, I think at least my perspective really has shifted to that of not one particular symptom needs to be dominant, right? So what I mean by that is if you, which is actually what we did, born out of our experience in our clinic, if you have in a single room, the patient together with a psychiatrist and a neurologist and a physiotherapist, each person is going to look at that patient's presentation within their own scope of training and practice and prioritize certain aspects of their presentation, but it'll likely be quite different from each other. And so who are we to say that they have a functional tremor and that's all, right? They have a syndrome. They have a syndrome of a collection of multiple different symptoms that are occurring together. And that's almost always the case, right? It's extremely unusual, at least in my experience, with functional mo movement disorders or FMD to have an isolated motor symptom without an accompanying either pain, fatigue, cognitive symptom, or a somatic anxiety or health preoccupation, for example, is super common in our most recent case series. And so who's to say that one is more important than the other? And so I think this does bring up an interesting question about framing. So if the tremor occurs exclusively in the context of panic attack, for example, or really severe anxiety, could that also not be framed as tremor as part of anxiety <laughs> and not necessarily functional tremor? So I think a little bit it has to do with thinking about what treatment would be most helpful for this particular patient in this circumstance and framing the diagnosis perhaps to link up to that in a way that I don't think is traditionally followed in regular medicine. Right. Well, I think that, that conversation really will lead us nicely into our subsequent two podcasts where we're going to be talking about what we think causes FND, both in terms of mechanisms in the body and why it happens. And we're going to have another podcast about treatment. So I hope you can join us for our other two podcasts. It's been such a pleasure to have my three guests with me, Sarah Lidstone from Toronto, Selma Abeck from Freiburg in Switzerland, and David Perez from Massachusetts General in Boston. Thank you to all of you, and I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening and for letting us join you on your commute while you're exercising or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients.